I'm Greg Johnson. Welcome to Countercurrents Radio. We are here at a special time to accommodate a guest from far away, from down under, Mike from Imperium Press is here. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. We are going to be talking today about a new book that Imperium Press has just released. It's called Reflections on Violence by George Sorrell. This is a classic book of syndicalist political philosophy, leftist political philosophy from the first decade of the 20th century. It was published in 1907. And yet it's had a huge influence since then. The fascists have been influenced by it. Various communist and anarchist theorists and practices have been influenced by it. And it's a book that I think people who are serious about political philosophy should read. So I was delighted to see that Imperium Press has brought this out. And I, I guess my first question is, why did you choose Sorel? Why Sorel? Well, I mean, Sorel, he kind of occupies this very interesting position in the history of ideas. He is a precursor to fascism in that he's a revolutionary syndicalist that, although and I'm sure we'll get into this, he regards himself as uh, continuing Orthodox Marxism in a more faithful way than even like the Orthodox Marxists themselves of his time were. And realistically, he I think he was wrong there. He, he, he struck out on a, a different path. And he, along with just very few others in the early part of the 20th century, created a third position, essentially. So you can see why Mussolini was so influenced by him. You can see a lot of what comes later in him, even though it's being discussed within a left-wing idiom nominally. But he's doing something quite different, quite interesting. So the book sort of has a, a reputation that precedes it. And when I first read it, it was interesting to encounter because it is very, very much of its time to really get every single drop out of reflections on violence. You do have to kind of understand what's going on in France in about 1906. But at the same time, there is so much in there as well that is perennial and of interest to us today that it's just a very interesting mix. And one of the things that I noticed was that there wasn't really an addition out there that really, it's certainly not from our perspective, that really puts it in the, in the context in which it's to be understood. So when you get that, when you get this context, when you really kind of get the background of what he's talking about and the context from which he's coming, it actually, it, it throws into sharp relief some of the stuff that's going on today. I think Sorrell is incredibly relevant today. Yeah, that is, that is very interesting. I first encountered Sorrell, well, I've heard his name, right? I heard his name dropped in intellectual context, the context of intellectual history, political philosophy. But I think it was around 2010, 2011, a, a donor at Countercurrents really strongly urged me to, to do some reading in Sorrell. And I think I actually walked into Left Bank Books in Seattle and bought On Violence. Uh, I think it was, a, it was like a Dover edition or something. It was T.E. Holmes translation. And I also ordered some other volumes of Sorrell in translation and dipped into it and found him you know, to be very, very interesting. And yet I got distracted basically, and I didn't have a chance to, to dig uh, much more deeply into his work. There were certain things that struck me immediately about him though, that I really liked. First of all, he was an engineer. He was from a family in Normandy. He had an extremely elite French education. He was highly intelligent. This was at a time when the French educational system was extremely elitist, and he, he ended up going to top universities, graduating in the top 10 of his class, things like that. He had a career as an engineer. He only started writing about intellectual matters when he was around 38, I think. And then he retired at the age of 45 and devoted the last 30 years of his life, basically, to being an independent intellectual. And one of the things that he talked about is that he had a great education, but he spent a lot of his time unlearning what he had learned in the schools by reading broadly. And he regarded himself as essentially an autodidact. 
uh, therefore. He wrote very widely on a number of interesting topics. He wrote about Renan, he wrote about Socrates, he wrote about Vico, he wrote a book on William James. He wrote on the methodology of the social sciences. He wrote on Marxism and syndicalism and the Dreyfus affair, et cetera. He's a very polemical writer, a very entertaining writer. I found myself laughing out loud in places <laughs> in reading on violence or reflections on violence. And he also had this astonishing, I hate to use a word like this, but it's the only one that comes to mind, neuroplasticity. Uh, by the time somebody is middle-aged, you just don't see people like that basically starting a new career as an intellectual. And he was constantly changing his thoughts, changing his mind, following new people, you know, coming up with new projects and things like that, right up to the end of his life, basically. He was striking out in new directions. And he was very influenced by Marx. He was uh, very influenced by Renan. He was influenced by Vico, which is a kind of astonishing thing in the 19th century. William James Bergson, uh, a lot of these thinkers of his time were influential on him, Nietzsche, and uh, he was widely regarded as an important person, sometimes difficult, sometimes confused, but people regarded him as, as somebody to take a stance on. So I, I just have to admire him as a man for being a, a very principled, fiery, self-educated figure uh, from a very elite upbringing and education, yet he was a very strong populist. He was a man of the people, and he had utter contempt for intellectuals, and he had utter contempt for party politics and scathing contempt for the bourgeoisie and scathing attempts for progressivism. And that's one thing that I find very interesting. He despised progressives, and yet he was a revolutionary Marxist and then syndicalist. Uh, what's going on there? Well, what he regards the bourgeois as effectively standing for, at least at the time that he's writing, is kind of the decay of the heroic and martial values that they had once stood for when capitalism was in its prime, basically. He regards this as the bourgeois as effectively spiritually dead, <laughs> to um, put it kind of bluntly, I guess. And it's interesting because, you know, he is a technocrat. He, he's an engineer, trained engineer in the period of Napoleon III's liberalization. And he ends up as a this like anti-state irrationalist that's talking about the Homeric virtues of the proletariat and everything. So he, he is a very idiosyncratic thinker. It's very hard to pigeonhole Georges Sorel. But yeah, this is, I mean, what he doesn't like about the bourgeois. Um, th this is effectively the ruling class, and it has been the ruling class for some time, but it's quite degraded in, in, in its spirituality, in its view of the world. And what he regards violence as doing, among other things, is affecting a kind of spiritual regeneration. At one point in the book, he talks about how capitalism, you know, he doesn't have this, this sort of axiomatic hatred of capitalism that you get, you know, from Marxists and others. He actually has a qualified kind of admiration for capitalism in its early stages, in that early capitalism is very much you get the spirit of the adventurer and the person sort of striking out into the unknown. It's a very Faustian kind of spirit behind early capitalism. The entrepreneur himself, a very Faustian figure. And, and of course, Sorel doesn't use that term, but he's, he's kind of barking up the same tree. He does have a respect for that. But by the time he's writing, which is, you know, I mean, he comes of age in right around the time of the Franco-Prussian War, and he's writing some 30 years later than that. At this time, all of that has completely been sapped and, and there's no vitality left. And the bourgeois is, is just utterly tame and conventional and very much, you know, what we might call materialistic now, like it just petty, really. And this is for him, this is anathema to everything that's good and true in the world. And he sees 
in the proletariat the potential for a regeneration. This is this is where it's all going to come from. He sees in them this vitality uh, that could be reborn, but it has to be reborn. It can't be reborn through the parliamentary socialists that are effectively sort of in charge on, in the left wing. They're the, the main left wing force at, at this time. He utterly despises them. Of all the people that you've mentioned, I would say the the people he likes the least are these parliamentary socialists, the way that we hate the Mitt Romneys of the world, right. basically. They are basically the ones that are standing in the way of what is good sort of coming back. Um, so he, he absolutely despises them. And then he spends a lot of time railing against this socialist named Jean Jaurès, who effectively stands for that for him and of course was the leader of the parliamentary socialists at this time so that is kind of the enemy and for Sorel the regenerative force is going to come from the bottom up he is a populist he's somebody who has great faith in the lower and middle lower classes and he regards that as sort of the fundament from which this regeneration will come one thing that's interesting though is that he's sort of despairing of the working class too because he sees that these parliamentary socialists and uh, and also really the the bourgeoisie are being very very effective in tamping down class consciousness and class struggle and he worries about that he worries about things like patriotism overcoming class consciousness and class warfare reformism overcoming class consciousness and class warfare and these things really bother him. And one of the things I think he wants to, to do is rekindle class consciousness and class struggle because he th thinks the proletariat is becoming middle class in some way. Oh, definitely. I, I mean, for him, Jaure and company, they are offering a kind of moderated, watered down revolution. And what they do is they keep the middle class in a kind of state of fear over the possibility of proletarian violence. And sort of, you know, from both sides, they act as a kind of de-radicalizing force. They de-radicalize the proletariat and they sort of mollify the middle classes, which Sorel, as I mentioned, believes that at one point that they were quite vital and they had a sort of energy about them. The parliamentary socialists are basically sort of sapping the energy on all sides. And what they're doing, basically, these parliamentary socialists, they're kind of selling peace of mind to the conservative elements of society who, because of this, they don't dare to use the force that they have at their disposal to basically sort of tamp down on um, these elements. So this is kind of the enemy for Sorel. And, and I think if you were to, if you were to replace the, the word class with racial and talk about racial consciousness in the 21st century, mm -hmm. that a lot of what Sorel is, is saying here suddenly sort of snaps into place and, and it makes sense from our perspective. Now he's not exactly our guy. Of course, you mentioned that he's uh he's kind of anti-patriotic for very strategic reasons here because it is, you know, class war is sort of what he's talking about. But mm -hmm. I think that this can be modulated. And if you look at some of what he's talking about, it's very applicable to us today. So yeah, no, he's, he's definitely, he's not just a sort of cheerleader for the lower classes, for the proletariat or anything like that. But he thinks that he has a kind of program by which they can be galvanized and, and turned into a genuinely revolutionary force. There's a passage here that I, I really love. This is from the introduction to the first edition. This actually made me laugh out loud. It states the issue nicely. He said, there would be two types of reformism. The one patronized by the Musée Social, the Direction du Travail and Jaurès, uh, which would work with the aid of pleas to eternal justice, maxims and half lies, the other proceeds by blows, by violence, in other words, the latter being the only one that is within the scope of uneducated people who have not yet been touched by the grace of advanced social economics. The wise men, the Democrats devoted to the cause of the rights of man and the duties of the informer, I think that's quite nice, the sociologist members of the bloc all think that violence will disappear when popular education becomes more advanced. They recommend, therefore, 
a great increase in the number of courses and lectures they hope to drown revolutionary syndicalism in the saliva of professors. I, I, I love this guy. Uh, he's a, he's a rip roaring polemicist. He's not mealy mouthed and he can actually be uh, genuinely funny. And he, he truly, he truly despises his enemies. But yeah, uh, the, the idea that you can uh, drown the proletariat and its fervor in the saliva of professors worried him uh, because he was seeing that that kind of meliorism was actually working and he wanted to uh, counteract that. So let's talk about his views on violence because it's very interesting. You think, okay, this is going to be a manifesto for wildcat insurrectionary violence and things like that. It turns out that it's actually very tame and that he spends a great deal of time distinguishing proletarian violence from bourgeois violence and basically saying that all the horrible things about the French Revolution, for instance, derive from the peculiar character of the French bourgeoisie and that proletarian violence would not resemble anything like Jacobinism and so forth, which I think is a really interesting effort on his part. But what then does he really mean by the violence of the, the proletariat, the syndicalist violence that he's, he's hoping will be redemptive. Right. So by violence, I mean, he makes a distinction in the book between force and violence. Force is basically the acts of the authority. So it's, it's top down. Um, i trying to think of a third term to use here, uh, but it's like top down violence basically. And, and what, what, he means by the word violence is effectively bottom-up revolt. So mm -hmm. by force, he means effectively what the state's doing, and by violence, he means effectively what the proletariat is doing. And for Sorel, the history of the development of capitalism is basically the history of force, more and more developing itself, more and more effectively st stepping into the role of the state. And of course, he's very anti-state. This is he, he's he, he, one of the things that he really kind of disdains about the parliamentary socialists is that they don't really actually want revolution. They they just want to be the ones in charge. They want to be the ones that are wielding force, and th they do it by kind of despicable means by really effectively just lying their way into power. That's not what he's interested in. He doesn't want the proletariat to get into power and then just do all the same stuff. For him, violence, which, as we said, it's bottom-up force or violence, is, is the answer for how to undo capitalism. The answer is not for the proletariat to acquire and then make use of force just like the middle class has, because, of course, the middle class has become completely... Um, mollified and, and weak as a result of the position that it's been in. The idea is not to reproduce the history of capitalism, it's to abolish it. And in this, he, he actually is in some ways, you can kind of see where he's coming from, where he's he, he essentially regards revolutionary syndicalism as the true heir of Marxism, very much kind of getting off the path here, like uh, for various reasons that he gives throughout the book. So this is what he means between force and violence. And the, the violence itself is kind of regenerative in the way that it it comes about. And some of that has to do with the, the particulars of what he's, the vision that he's got as to how it's going to come about. So basically what he hangs this all on is the general strike. And it's something that can't really be analyzed, the, the general strike. It's basically kind of like a picture. It's, it's not a uh, formula or a series of prescriptions like first this and then that. And then, the, then you, know, you take power here and then you organize in this way and then you'll do the general strike. Basically, it's an undivided whole. It's a, it, it kind of gets into what he means by myths. The myth of the general strike for him is not a description of a, a thing so much as it's an expression of, of a determination. It's almost like an imperative in the language of propositions. It's, it's basically saying, do this, this is the goal, 
but he doesn't really tell you how to get there. And, and in fact, in uh, I believe it's in the introduction or in the letter to his friend at the beginning of the book, he says, I'm not going to give you a roadmap here. This is just basically a series of vignettes or sketches uh, that effectively give you a kind of goal to aim at sort of thing. So th I think that this is really the most important thing that he does. This is his we're kind of leading into his theory of myth here, but it's the mythic aspect of the violence that is going to be redemptive and, and regenerative for him. Let's talk a bit about what syndicalism is as opposed to orthodox Marxism, for instance. I think that's an important uh, distinction here. Syndicalism versus the Marxism of his time. And then, of course, syndicalism versus what Bolshevism became after he wrote this book. Right. Okay. So, I mean, most people are, are fairly familiar with Marxism. Uh, the, the overall sort of TLDR of Marxism is that it's the, the material conditions that drive history and that these things sort of proceed in an, almost an automatic way. And Sorrell kind of goes into like why he, he actually offers a, a kind of an interesting take on why he thought Marx wrote that way based on the materials available to him at the British Library. But that's kind of a you know, thumbnail sketch, very basic of, of what Marxism is, is about. Syndicalism is something a little bit different. Basically, syndicalism is effectively autonomous worker units or worker cells that are self-organizing. And it's, it's very much tied to what later became corporativism, which Sorel himself had a, uh, an influence on. Basically, it's a kind of anarchism where the organization sort of happens spontaneously from the proletariat itself. It's not sort of directed from the top down. So the syndicalists formed these cells, effectively, that were self-advocating and self-organized. And the revolutionary aspect of it is basically where the, the, the syndicates regard themselves as not needing the masters anymore. Not This is sort of how they uh, believe that they're going to be able to abolish capitalism. Basically, that the, the workers themselves are able to run their own operations. And as I say, it sort of develops into corporativism later. So that's kind of the difference between syndicalism and Marxism. And Sorel is, he's not on one side or another. He believes that these two things can be reconciled. And in fact, that revolutionary syndicalism is the, the true heir to Marxism. He believes that like socialism has kind of run off the rails a bit as it gets further on into the 19th century and into the early 20th century, that the ideas of socialism, they can't sort of be kept afloat by just sort of regurgitating Marx in these like endless commentaries. But what you have to do is kind of adapt the spirit of what Marx is saying to the facts of the situation that can then assume a, a sort of revolutionary aspect and for Sorel, that's the general strike. That's that's what he believes is going to do that. Right. So the, the way I was reading uh, Sorel is that his critique of Marxism really is that it's too much in the spirit of intellectualism, too much in the spirit of lawyers and technocrats. It's too wedded to state power models of social organization, top-down organization, Brahmin values, you know, the scribblers should be dictating to the doers, be people who work with their hands, and things like that. And that, of course, was something that, say, Bakunin was critical of. If you look at 19th century anarchists and their predictions about what Marxism would be, somebody like Bakunin uh, saying it would just be some kind of totalitarian statism. Uh, they were pretty right. And the idea that Sorel had that, no, there's going to be a difference. There's just got to be a difference between Jacobinism and statism and top-down order and the kinds of uh, utopian ideals and terrorism that's associated with intellectuals. Uh, intellectuals have grand plans for all of us, and then when they when these plans get thrown in their face, they get discouraged, and then they resort to terrorism. He's thinking about the French Revolution. That seemed to be pretty much the route that communism actually took. 
that Marxism actually took. Uh, the, and the great question for me is this, syndicalism, okay, syndicalism is the idea that maybe workers can run their own shops, their own factories, their own establishments, but does that replace the market? Uh, because you can have worker-owned co-ops in a capitalist society. Did he have a particular picture of what's going to integrate the economic activities, coordinate the economic activities of all of these autonomous worker-owned entities? If it's not going to be some kind of Jacobin state or technocracy or whatever, what is it going to be? What is going to integrate and coordinate the activities of these uh, autonomous worker syndicates? Well, this is a question that um, it never gets answered in Marx, and Sorel does sort of address it a little bit sort of at the very end of the book, but he is, in this book, he's more concerned about like the dynamic of violence, and he doesn't really talk a whole lot about that. It's, it's interesting to sort of think where that could have gone, because the fascists who took a lot of inspiration from him, really, they had their own views on it. I mean, for him, it's it's not enough to just sort of recreate the state. He believes the vitality that's effectively going to be reborn out of the regenerative violence is going to enable the proletariat to be able to run their own, as you say, run their own shops more effectively and with more energy and in a way that's going to be beneficial to society. Now, this is the part of Sorel, I think, that's like, it's not as interesting as, as some of the other stuff, because I just, I don't think that this is at all feasible that, you know, sin, and I don't think anarcho-syndicalism syndicalism is, is a really serious prescription for an industrial society. Right. But Sorel does offer some very interesting critiques of Marx. And, and actually one of the ones that I think is the deepest and most powerful is that he says that Marx effectively regarded the the um, the pr procession from capitalism to socialism to kind of hinge on the continual improvement in the capitalist mode of production so basically right. uh, everything gets more and more efficient and as a result the rate of profit falls and etc cetera, etc cetera. and and this drives the the proletariat effectively to become a revolutionary but what Sorel says is that well, that might have been that might have been uh, something worth considering back in 1869 or whatever when um, when Capital was written. But you know, with the benefit of hindsight, we can we can now see that that is not how it went. <laughs> Basically, mm -hmm. capitalism did not proceed in in this way. It didn't just get more and more efficient, it, it, it actually has declined in, in its efficiency and in, in, in the way that it, it operates. And part of that is because of this degenerating element that's crept into the middle class. They've lost their energy. They've lost all of this. And Marx didn't foresee that happening. And the fact that it has happened has in some ways made orthodox Marxism kind of obsolete in its in its analysis of the situation. So this is why he's concentrating on the spirit of Marx, you know, saying that we have to adapt the spirit of the thing to the facts of the matter and focus especially on the revolutionary aspect of the proletariat. He believes that the orthodox Marxists, as well as the parliamentary socialists, have effectively given up the ghost there. And really all that's left is uh, revolutionary syndicalism and I think that actually this is quite an incisive uh, critique of Marxism coming from the left. And, you know, I've, I've read as I was putting together this volume, Reflections on Violence and all the other stuff that went into our book, I, you know, I did end up reading a couple of articles by contemporary Marxists on Sorel, and they don't like him very much. <laughs> and I think the reason why they don't like him is that he's actually kind of on the money with a, a lot of the critiques of Orthodox Marxism. So... Yeah. 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 I agree. The thing that's interesting to me about Sorel is that um, he thinks of himself as a, as a Marxist, as a revolutionary, but not as a progressivist, uh, which is interesting. Yet his value system is extremely archaic. 
which is quite interesting. First of all, his value system is is conservative. You have to say it's conservative. He he has a, a very conservative view of the family life and things like that. He has a a love of martial virtue. He praises the virtues of warriors. And beyond that, he also embraces the idea of myth. And so, you know, this is in the 19th century. The Enlightenment's been going for a couple of hundred years. One of the things that the Enlightenment has always tried to push back on is to replace myth with science, obscurity with clarity, darkness with light. And here he is embracing archaic warrior values, archaic patriarchal values, and the idea of myth as absolutely central to his understanding of how revolution is going to happen. So it's a very peculiar thing. He's, he's, trying, to, he's trying to carry forward the Marxist project of revolution, but he's wedding it to things that are archaic in terms of values and, uh, and also irrationalist. I find that fascinating. And one of the influences on this is clearly Vico. He read Vico or you know, sort of an abridged translation of the new science by Michelet, which was very, very, um, <laughs> how to put it, it was embarrassed by uh, Vico's discussions of myth and things like that and, and tried to eliminate as much of that as possible. It's fascinating. Uh, Vico has this idea of a cyclical eternal history, the ideal eternal history. The first thing that Sorel does is just reject the idea of the cyclicalness of history. Why? Because he believes in revolution. He's still progressive enough to want to believe that things are not going to go back to the beginning. They're going to move to a higher level. And yet he wants to embrace things that come from Vico's understanding of archaic society. The, the first ages are the ages of the age of gods, which is the age of myth. And then the second age in Vico's ideal eternal history is the age of heroes. Then there comes the age of men, and then there's this degenerate period where everything falls apart, and then there's supposed to be a new beginning. He doesn't want to talk about a new beginning, it seems, but at the same time, he believes that bourgeois society has fallen into deep decadence, uh, certainly what you could uh, correspond to Vico's fourth age, the barbarism of reflection, and he longs for a return to myth and heroism as something that can revivify society, and that these things are going to be found primarily in the proletariat. And so it does sound to me that he wants to start history over again out of decadence. And he's using this Vikian lens to envisage ways that society, which he thinks is decadent, can be revitalized. Yeah, he is uh, very interesting in this way. You could imagine what a kind of Molotov cocktail uh, it was to lob into French bourgeois society this idea of the, the martial, mythical virtues uh, read through the, a, a Vichian lens, <laughs> something that um, it was quite alien to what was going on at the time, although in some ways not, because you think about the early 1900s, you, uh, the era that we call the fin de cycle in um, France, and this is a, an era where science had made many, many strides throughout the 19th century, but there was a feeling that it had failed to kind of bring its, to bring its project to a conclusion. Like it seemed like the sciences were growing further and further apart, that they were becoming more and more irreconcilable. This would of course continue into the, into the 20th century with some of the developments and things like quantum mechanics and, and uh, special relativity and everything like that. But the, the feeling in the air was that things were a lot more complicated than we thought. And the optimism that had been there about 100 or 120 years before had basically evaporated. So this was kind of what was in the air at the time. And so he's in, in a sense, he's, he's very different an idiosyncratic thinker, but as well, he kind of prefigures and, and characterizes his age. But yeah, he's definitely, he, he's a bit of an oddball because he is a revolutionary figure who has extremely conservative instincts and sentiments. And, and so in, in this sense, the, re, the, the combination of revolution and conservatism, I think really is he's very much our guy. Like uh, I think, uh, and Vico's another one that I think uh, 
deserves a, a, a lot more attention in our spheres. Um, but he's uh, the Sorel is, is is very much concerned with the utopists, which are the uh, you know the parliamentary socialists and uh, even the orthodox Marxians. Uh, for what he means by utopia is uh, it's it's kind of similar to what what we think of as utopia. But he also sort of uses uses that almost as a stand-in for theories, in a way. Exactly, um, they're they're creations of intellectuals. That's right. Yeah. Uh, they're products of reflection, and they're also very conservative in a bad way. That uh, they, they the effect of these utopias is always towards reformism, uh, to reform mm -hmm. the existing system and kind of patch it up and make it run again, even though it's it the rot might be so deep, that the thing, whole thing needs to be replaced. This is kind of what utopia u utopias do, and, and we we think of utopianism. As something that's very well, it's 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 utopian, right? It's it's something that is supposed to be kind of pie in the sky, idealist, and and reaching beyond. It's it's itself very Faustian in a way. Uh, he regards it as utterly conventional and um, just leading us in, into a cul-de-sac, really. And and so what he offers in place of the utopia is the myth. Right. And as, as I mentioned before, the myth is not so much, um, it's not, a, it's not a, a program or a description as much as it is a kind of expression of the will to, towards a goal. Um, and, and this is what makes the myth so interesting. And I, and I think this is the, the main takeaway, the, the main thing that we can get from Sorel uh, is this notion of the myth. Uh, because a myth as a kind of picture, as a kind of goal, uh, can't really be refuted because it's basically identical with the convictions of, you know, the the revolutionary proletariat, say. Um, and and, and he, it, it is what he says, he calls it the expression of those convictions in the language of movement, which is, I think, a very poetic way of, of describing it. And it's it can't be refuted. I mean, you can't really refute a goal or, or an ideal. Um, you can you can maybe come up with reasons why it is unfeasible or unlikely to be attained, but even that doesn't act as a refutation. And he gives examples of, of myths in the past. They've been just dead wrong, but they've still been useful in galvanizing people into a, um, you know, into a, a change of epoch, he gives the example of the early Christians who yeah. ex expected the return of Christ and the complete dissolution and, and destruction of the pagan world at the end of the first generation after the death of Christ. And of course, this didn't happen, but it didn't matter that it didn't happen. It, the myth was still able to do its work, you know, shall we say. And the apocalypticism that it was characterized the the very like the first early generations of the church he explains in a very interesting way how that was transmuted into effectively monasticism but the myth continued to live right like instead of expecting the return of christ on earth tomorrow over time becomes like millenarianism and uh it's it's it still has the vitality the myth still is able to galvanize people and it's unanalyzable into its parts. You could refute every single part individually and it wouldn't matter. Basically, this is something that it's a goal or it's almost like an imperative or a command. I think I mentioned that before. It's like a command in the language of propositions, in the language of a, a mythos, a story, a narrative. So he gives that example. He also gives the examples of the the Protestants as well, the Luthers and the Calvins of Northwestern Europe that looked for a regeneration and a kind of religious exaltation of their world. This didn't actually happen, but it didn't matter that it didn't happen because it was still world historical and, and it changed the religious landscape of Europe. I won't give every example that he gives, but the most important one that he gives is actually the French Revolution itself. The French Revolution did not achieve almost any of its aims, and the aims that it did achieve were achieved through terror and, and just 
horrific it, it, things that were so traumatic to France that it was still that they were still touchy about it in his day, you know, 130 years later. But it didn't matter because it was mythic in such a way. It was effectively the the sort of core mythos of France of, of that world, right? All of the violence and all of the the terrible things that happened during the terror itself sort of paled in comparison to the heroic uh, sacrifices and all the violence, frankly, that happened during the Revolutionary War to where the terror was just basically sort of peanuts beside this war, which kind of took on a Homeric aspect. And it was just this Homeric aspect of it that created a kind of center around which this whole society could cohere. Um, so for him, it's the mythic aspect of these things that's really the driving force behind history. And it's interesting to kind of think about in our context what our myth or goal would be. So yeah, I, th I think that he's really on to something here. There's something pre-rational that can't be argued, that won't formulate itself into a utopia or a theory that really is the driving force. I, I think this is a very interesting idea. Again, with Vico, myth isn't a product of conscious thought, which separates it from utopia, which is a conscious thing that you think of. And therefore, if we set ourselves the task of what is our myth or should, how do we create a myth? It's not a myth. <laughs> if we can create it, it's not a myth in this sense. A utopia is something that you have, you think up, but a, a myth is something that has you. It comes up on you from behind and grabs you and you don't fully comprehend it. It's, a bi it's bigger than you. You don't see its outlines. You can't control it. It has power over you. You don't have power over it. And yeah, there is an interesting question. What is our myth? What is our vitalizing myth? Because we, it would be nice to have one, and it's not the thing, the kind of thing that you can create. Uh, because if you can create it, then it isn't a myth. I, re I remember Carl Schmidt in his Crisis of Parliamentary Democracy talks about Sorel. And he talks about the myth. And he says, well, he was wrong about the general strike, but there is a new myth. And he cites Mussolini, Mussolini talking about the myth of the nation. That is... That is the powerful myth, uh, the myth that's going to organize the 20th century. I, I still think that's a very powerful thing. I still think it has a lot of purchase on people. What are some other myths, uh, sort of vivifying, empowering myths that people like us can draw upon? Well, um, it, it depends which, um, which particular... Uh, group you're talking about. If you're talking about the radical right uh, for a moment, there was an interesting one. Uh, there was an interesting thing that it actually is is very close to what Sorel was was going at with the general strike a few years ago. Do you remember the meme of the white strike? Um, th this is obviously right. something that came and went, so it didn't have the staying power. It's, it, that's, this is probably not our myth, but uh, it, it's an example of something that um, you know could uh, fit with this mythic mode. Um, another another one that we could think of is something like the Charlottesville trials um, and all of the injustice that happened at these trials, the railroading of James Fields, and that just that whole that particular that episode, I mean, for better or worse, there, this, I know you're a huge critic of uh, a lot of what went down there at, as am I, and it didn't exactly go to plan or anything like that, but it was, it was a turning point. And there's certainly an aspect of martyrdom, especially with, with James Fields, that could be, could grow into a kind of mythic complex. But I think that the, probably the overall myth that I think is shared throughout all of the radical right is the myth of the reawakening of white racial consciousness. That this is something that, as I mentioned before, with the early Christians, they expected the return of Christ by this certain time. It didn't happen by that certain time, but it didn't matter. 
we can sort of see that in the myth of the reawakening of white consciousness as consciousness of ourselves as a coherent people or as a family of peoples. I think this is something that genuinely is happening. And the word myth kind of sounds like it's, it's trivializing it, but Sorel means myth in a very restricted way. And he certainly doesn't mean a story that's not true. Exactly. Um, he, he means a story that's, that's truth is not the point. Um, but that doesn't mean it's false. Uh, it, it's, it's a, um, it's a kind of centripetal force that is bringing people together. It's, it's a kind of constitutive principle of what it is to be that group. That's the myth. And I think that the myth of white racial consciousness is a definite contender there. Now, you could talk about other groups as well. You could talk about the revival of paganism in the modern world. There's definitely a mythic aspect to that, of the rebirth of a religion that has never really died and that basically that Christianity acted as a kind of preservative force for it. I won't really get into that because I think that's kind of, that's a very specific and particular kind of myth or whatever, but it's an example of a cohering myth that could sort of bring that particular group of people together. There's certainly, you could think of myths that would do the same for Christianity itself. But I think the important one to really think about is the reawakening of white ethnic consciousness. That to me seems like something to consider. Yeah, I would agree with that. I have a question here from I'll Take My Stand. He sends 10 US dollars. Thank you very much. I believe this is uh, directed to us both. From an ethno-nationalist perspective, how do you reconcile the importance of class analysis with the necessity of hierarchy? This is an interesting question. I'm getting less and less hierarchical in my old age, uh, to be perfectly honest. For one thing, years ago, I, I put this in the introduction to my book, Truth, Justice in a Nice White Country. I always thought it was tone deaf for people on our side to say that we stand for hierarchy. Really? No, not unqualifiedly. We stand for just hierarchies. We don't believe in unjust hierarchies. We stand for truth and justice, not hierarchy. And I think that's the way I like to formulate it. I think a lot of the allegedly necessary hierarchies that people talk about in our circles aren't that necessary at all, to be perfectly honest. The things I've come to believe would absolutely appall Baron Evola. His monocle would drop from his eye if he could read some of the 19th century radical egalitarian populists uh, that I've been reading recently. But Mike, what are your thoughts on this? Again, the question is from an ethno-nationalist perspective, how do you reconcile the importance of class analysis with the necessity of hierarchy? Well, I see where you're coming from, Greg, as far as um, hierarchy not necessarily being the constitutive principle behind the radical right. And, you know, I think this, this is something that Jonathan Bowden said many, many years ago. And of course, you can imagine that he, his thinking would have gone on and evolved and changed over time had he lived. But he really did believe that hierarchy and inequality was the kind of core of what the radical right is about. I don't really believe that, although I, I do think that hierarchy is part of that. I think that you could point to other things as well. You could point to uh, particularism over universalism. You could point to immanentism and anti-abstraction. I think that there's quite a few other things that go into making up what it is that we're about. But I do think the hierarchy is part of that. But it's a hierarchy that, as you say, has to be just. I, I would phrase it as a ha hierarchy that's natural. And that is in, in conformity with natural law. I would say that too. Yeah. Um, so for, for me, the, the ultimate sort of a vision of, of a natural or just hierarchy is really the family. The family is kind of the model for that. And this is why I am uh, so strong on the uh, patriarchalism of Robert Filmer. I think that he's really, he's, he's kind of hit the nail on the head, which is that a, if we believe as ethno-nationalists that a nation is an extended family, then there's a degree to which it needs to be governed as a family, and which means that there's a kind of paternalistic aspect to it. So hierarchy, very important to us as, you know, an intellectual movement and an ideology and um, 
a set of theologies. Class, I, I, I think, is a lot less important in terms of class analysis. I, I think that this is something that it's it's a lot more of a left wing thing. It's, uh, of course, you know, not foreign to the right. Uh, certainly, we have the Dumazilian trifunctional hypothesis. You know, classes. It's been part of you know Indo-European societies from the very very beginning. Evola obviously very concerned with class analysis and you know the warrior and the priestly functions and all of that. These things have to work in a kind of they. We have to have the class collaboration to use a uh, fascist formulation of it. But this is really just to say that the the society as an extended family has to function as a family. And and if it's class war between <laughs> between the different parts of the family, that's a dysfunctional family. So right. the class analysis always has to be sort of subordinated to this natural extended family analysis. And and frankly, it has to all be it, it for me, it all has to sort of come down to a theology. You know, I'm no fan of Jordan Peterson, but I do like the way that he phrases ideology as a kind of stunted theology. I think that that's actually, he's right to say that. So ultimately, all of our ideological considerations of class analysis or uh, even hierarchy um, are, are fundamentally theological constructs, and they have to be viewed in a genuinely theological way. Yeah, I, I I I see your point there. Uh, let's return to Sorel because we're sort of running out of time. Uh, I think Sorel is a fascinating figure for many reasons. One, he's a, a brilliant writer. He was obviously a very intelligent man. He absorbed a lot of interesting influences, crystallized new ideas. If you look at him in terms of his value system, he was a believer in the patriarchal family in warrior virtues. Uh, he was very, very critical of slave morality type uh, themes, envy, resentment, hatred, uh, pity. He was very critical of intellectuals. Uh, he was very critical of uh, the kind of intellectuals who have big plans for us all, usually utopias, excogitated from stuff that they heard from their professors. He's a believer in vitalism, in the the image over the idea, if you will, the myth over the utopia. Objectively, everything about him, I think, is rightist, except for his idea that somehow we can have revolutionary <laughs> Marxist syndicalism, and that'll that'll somehow work. And I think that if he had lived a bit longer, the last thing in this volume is an essay he penned in defense of Lenin. It was more in defense of himself. But the critic that he was responding to uh, basically, basically had Lenin's number. Uh, this was early on in the revolution and saw that this was a Jacobin form of despotism that was up and running. I think if Sorel had lived, uh, he died, I think, in 1922. If he had lived another 10 years he might have been a, a revolutionary thinker of the right by that point. There was certainly a pipeline of Marxism to the revolutionary right. And in terms of his value system, his vitalism, his patriarchal values, his conservative values, his love of martial virtue, his contempt for intellectuals, placators, professors, you know, who want to drown the proletariat and drool and so on, I think he would have ended up as a figure on the right. And that's why I think he's an important figure for us to take up and read. I think there's a lot that can inspire us. The only thing that is sort of sobering about it is a point that Heidegger also makes, which is that if you really understand what he's saying, Sorel's saying or Heidegger's saying, there's no way that we can think our way out of the decadence of modernity. <laughs> because the idea that we can think our way out of nihilism or decadence is nihilism. And that we have to be open to the fact that there are larger historical forces that are outside the control of our agency, outside the boundaries of our understanding, that these forces are the things that change history. And he, he talks about these as myths. For Heidegger, it's just the event. 
the uh, Air Ignis, it just happens. It comes upon you, it comes up behind you, picks you up and carries you away and changes the meaning of everything and a new world begins. We want that to happen, of course. We're looking for signs of that happening, but we can't control it. And if we did control it or tried, if we could control it, it wouldn't be a solution. It wouldn't be a real, a real alternative to the situation that we're in. Yeah, I agree with a lot of that. I won't recap because I, I definitely feel the same way about Sorrell as far as that he's mostly a right-wing figure and the degree to which he's a left-wing figure. It's it's interesting because he's almost like this flower that bloomed in the desert of um, Marxist thinking. <laughs> like he's, he's one of the only really truly interesting figures, I think, in, in that whole milieu. And as a Marxist, he's he's very interesting because you know he wants to reconcile um, the absolute the the scientific precision and uh, determination of Marxism with human will. He wants to yeah. reinforce human will, and this is a very hard path to walk to reconcile those two things. And the way that he does that is is a way I think that we can really take something out of because he focuses. I mean, he, he's, he's this brilliant intellectual, this self-taught, idiosyncratic person who just kind of came out of nowhere, like I say, kind of like a Molotov cocktail hurled into bourgeois French society. A very intellectual person, very well-read, very excellent writer. But he comes down and the conclusion basically is that he's pointing you towards radical action and away from theory. And I think that this is something that we need, actually, for ourselves in our spheres today. Now, this is not to say that we should give up on reading and all become illiterate savages or barbarians or anything like that, but that basically we do need to understand that moral convictions and what really drives people at the end of the day doesn't depend on reasoning, doesn't even really depend on the kind of education of the individual will. But it, it depends on these chthonic forces that are sort of welling up from within us and that are kind of part of the, uh, to use the Nivolian phrase, the myth of the blood. This is something that is very deep under the surface. And Sorel is kind of gesturing at that and his sort of theory, so to speak, of myth, I think it's something that we could really very much use. And as, as you said, Greg, uh, myth is not something that you generate yourself. It's something that arises spontaneously out of the culture itself. It comes from a very deep place. But it's our job to, to identify that and to point to that and to have that sort of be our locus of our constitutive center. And that Sorel really gives us the tools to understand that in an intellectual way, but in, in a sort of Wittgenstein's ladder way, once you have climbed up the ladder, you throw it away. For us to really understand that it's myth that is the driving force and is, is what's really going to get us out of the, the nihilism that we've uh, wandered into over the last you know 300 years or so, uh, or more, uh, that Sorel gives us the, the tools to do that in, in a considered and an intelligent way. So I think that's what makes him valuable. Yeah, I think our, our, our task, since we can't fabricate a new myth, is to at least clear the ground for it and make people receptive to it. And the clearing of the ground uh, is just the work of critique, but it's also the work of art. It's the work of memes. It's the work of mockery. Uh, uh, and we're, we're really good at that. We're bulls in a china shop demolishing the reigning paradigm. And it's beautiful. It's pleasurable to watch. And it is falling apart at an astonishing rate. Very much so. Uh, there was a kind of there was a kind of mythic aspect to the alt right back in the Trump days of uh, the meme war. There was a very mythic aspect to that. And that was part of that. There was a real vitalism at that point. Um, so, you know, that's something that we can look at and aim at recapturing in the situation we're in now. Yeah, there was a certain magic there. There's no question about it. Things were coming together beautifully. It was bigger than any one mind. It was a spontaneous order in the Hayekian sense. Uh, you know, people were, instead of the marketplace, it was the social media medium. 
But these ideas were being put out there and being taken up and being embroidered and transmuted and just powerfully transformed. And, and it was a kind of a magical thing. There's no question about it. One thing that strikes me about what we need is we need to get back that vitality issue. Just the sheer animal vitality that is one of the things that Sorel is trying to point to. And I think that the phrase that really summarizes that is, is from Robert Frost to his description of a liberal as a man who won't take his own side in a fight. That is a beautiful description of somebody who is decadent, who has been intellectually devitalized. And the, the way to describe who we are and what we're doing is that we take our own side in a fight. I think that that captures the change of perspective that we need. And also just the, the realignment of vital forces. The man who won't take his own side in a fight is decadent because basically he's been talked out of being an, a self-respecting animal. <laughs> and we have to regain our sheer animal self-assertion. No healthy animal refuses to take its own side in a fight. And if white people aren't going to suffer the fate of unhealthy animals, of unadapted animals, then we're going to have to start taking our own side. Oh, very much so. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. Uh, we, we need to start thinking about what our, what our myth is, what our epic is, what is it that gives the epical color to our lives? What is it that places us in a world historic framework? Because once that falls into place, there is nothing that can stop us. Um, One of the things that's fascinating that's about this book is he has a chapter, the, the ethics of producers. And it's very clear that he's not talking about ethical propositions. He's not talking about ethical theories. He's not talking about morale. Well, he's not talking about morals so much as morale, which is interesting. He talks about how groups are galvanized into action through conflict. And this, of course, makes me think of Carl Schmitt, uh, the enemy. He talks about how the early Christians, uh, well, the later early Christians, after they gave up on the imminent return of Christ and were living under the Roman Empire, they felt that they were in an eternal battle with the forces of Satan and that the Roman Empire was the embodiment of these evils and the martyrs were the victims who had shed blood. And one of the things that Sorel talks about is, you know, historical evidence indicates that there weren't all that many martyrs. There weren't that many persecutions. The church wasn't as oppressed as they make it out there was a lot going on in these martyrologies that sort of remind us of perhaps overblown historical or quasi-historical persecutions of the 20th century, for instance. But the myths, and let's just say lies, <laughs> you know, because we're talking about an amalgam of mythology and then just propaganda here, that shaped the mentality of the early Catholic Church in the West was a powerful thing. And because these people existed mentally in a battle, that summoned up morale, that summoned up their animal forces. And so when he's talking about ethics, he's really talking about animal passions, taking one's own side because there's another side and there's an existential conflict here. Uh, he talks about the great wars of the French Revolution and the ethos that that evoked in the French. This was before Napoleon came along and made it more mechanical, right? But there was a sense on the part of the people who fought in these wars that every man was fully responsible for the fate of the whole nation and would give his all, and that they were in a struggle for survival, and that this basically summoned up enormous commitment, moral fervor, moral seriousness. And uh, again, he's, he's, he's hoping that the struggle 
between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie, which is being tamped down by meliorism and reformism and the welfare state and all this kind of stuff, which he dreads, he wants to go back to that hot, polarized enmity that stirs up this vital force. Again, there are different sides and you're taking your own side and it's absolutely crucial and every man has to give his all. That kind of morale, that kind of commitment, that kind of collectivism, it's sort of an individualistic collectivism because each and every man is potentially a Homeric hero, but at the same time, he's basically subordinating himself and taking full responsibility for the, the good of the whole. That's a very powerful analysis, I think, and it's, it's something to, to bear in mind. Polarization is absolutely crucial. And with polarization, you know, comes, you know, the stories of martyrs, some of them true, others cynically uh, exaggerated. But, but these are the kinds of things uh, that are involved with myths and that move history forward. And so we want the most m intense polarization possible. That's the only thing that's going to save us. And anything that depolarizes the political field is death to us. And I, I think that's something that Sorel brings nicely into focus for me. Definitely. I mean, if you wanted a, if you wanted a time in history to live in, to be a hero, this is a good one. And it's also a good time for the conditions of struggle to kind of come to the fore because th things are so polarized and they're only going to get more so as the things get worse for us as a people. One of the things that Sorel talks about in the book is that he talks a lot about the sublime. And yes, I he, love he, that. It's a very important theme. And moral sublimity is what he's reaching for. So go ahead and right. talk about that. Sure, yeah. Uh, basically, for him, the sublime in ethics is anything that kind of like goes beyond the, the mere formalism. Like he talks about the, um, I, I'm trying to think of the, the term he uses, but he's just basically talking about going through the rote repetition of, you know, the rites. And he's it, most of the time he's talking about the, the Catholic church at this, at this time, although he's not an enemy of the Catholic church. He's of course a, a Frenchman uh, at this time. So, uh, but anyway, any, anything, any ethics that goes beyond the sort of like mere formality, anything that's capable of being radical and revolutionary, this is what he's talking about when he mentions the sublime and what he says is that this is brought about by a state of war, basically. And, and what makes this interesting is that the sort of, you know, he uses the example of early Christianity. This is one of his cardinal examples throughout the whole book. The plebeian nature of Christianity at this time is overcome by kind of outsourcing the moral fervency to, at first, to martyrdom, and then later on to monasticism. It creates a kind of elite fundamentalism uh, that keeps the religious spirit healthy, uh, even in times of peace. And this, this is the genius of monasticism is that this, this can be carried on even in times of peace or, or and if, you know, we're moving outside of the, the Catholic church and talking about say Protestantism, uh, the, the radical sects uh, with it within uh, the Protestant countries sort of take on this character for that religion. But the idea is that it's the condition of struggle that keeps the moral sense healthy. And we are in a position right now at this moment in history where we as a people are very much beleaguered and mired in struggle. And a lot of the people around us are sleepwalking through it. So it's the conditions of struggle and war are there for us. They're there for us at, in the radical right. But it's our job, obviously, to, to try and wake up our friends and neighbors, but the conditions of struggle are there. And as much as we seem to be sort of fighting a losing battle at times, the fact is things look very different now than they did back in like 2012 or 2013 in like the Obama era. We are very much a vital and, and growing force, a beleaguered force in the culture. But part of why we have made such an impact it's just the fact of this struggle, and, and Sorel's absolutely on the money about that. It's the state of war that brings the sublime aspect of morality, and 
there is a sublimity to what it is that we're doing with all the silly meme stuff and everything. There's a definite, a, an absolutely deadly serious aspect to what we're doing too. Absolutely. And this is why I've been very critical of irony becoming absolute. I think it's useful for selling things, but ultimately the ethos that's going to win is not an ironic ethos, but an ethos of absolute commitment. And that approaches the sublime. The irony doesn't approach the sublime. It won't get you to the sublimity on its own, but commitment will. There's a beautiful passage where he's talking about Renan um, and, and his, um, his fears, basically, about the intellectual degeneracy of, of the culture, well, the moral degeneracy of his culture. I'm just going to try and pick this up. It's in the, the chapter on the ethics of the producers. Uh, I think it's the last main chapter. Let us examine closely the reasons which made Renan dread a decadence of the bourgeoisie. He was struck by the decay of religious ideas. Quote, an immense moral and perhaps intellectual degeneracy will follow on the day of the disappearance of religion from the world. We can dispense with religion because others have it for us. I think this is very important. Those who do not believe are carried along by the more or less believing majority. But when the majority lose this impulse, the men of spirit will go feebly to the attack, close quote. And then he goes on. It is the absence of the sentiment of the sublime, which Renan dreaded. Like all old people in their days of sadness, he thought of his childhood and adds, quote, man is of value in proportion to the religious sentiment, which he preserves from his first education and which colors his whole life. But the source of sublimity is drying up remarks Sorel. And then he quotes Renan again, religious people live in a shadow. We live in the shadow of a shadow. He's talking about we who don't believe the religion anymore. And then he, and then he asks, and this is italicized, on what will those who come after us live? And I, I think this is very important. It, it, it's, he's saying that whether it's true or not, okay, and not all religions are true, the dominant religion of a society is a kind of social capital. And those who don't believe it are depending upon those who do just to make life work, right? And those of us who don't believe it, well, you know, we live in the shadow of a shadow. Religious people live in a shadow. We live in the shadow of a shadow. What are the people who are going to come, going to live on? right? It's a question. We've, we've consumed all the capital. We've consumed all the glue that holds society together. Unbelief has come along and basically God is dead. It's the same horror that Nietzsche felt about the, the end of Christianity. Nietzsche was actually horrified that Christianity had died. He was angry at it because he thought it died of its own weaknesses. But he was horrified at a world without a reigning meaning and structure to it. And Renan is ex experiencing that too. And uh, Sorel is in terror of that. And part of his project is to revive the sublime in some way. Religion is gone. He's going to try and revive it as the ethos of the revolutionary proletariat. Maybe that's not the way to do it. However, later, not so much, not so long after he wrote this, again, as Schmidt points out, Mussolini came forward and said, and Mussolini was influenced by Sorel. And Mussolini said, our myth is the myth of the nation. And that's a very powerful myth. And it's a very powerful organizing and motivating myth. So that's maybe how the sublime can come back. It comes back in struggle. And one of the reasons why Christianity failed in, in Sorel's words is that the church no longer was formidable. It sort of just became bland and boring and not particularly scary. It, 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 the church militant lost its militancy. But society definitely needs some core 
division and struggle uh, that militancy and moral sublimity can can rally around. Most definitely, yeah. It's uh, I, I, as you're talking there about the um, the the lack of struggle and and the the sort of the way that society degenerates in, in the face of this, it basically as a victim of its own success. I, I just keep circling back to Vico here, <laughs> especially as it regards the um, the idea of of reason and uh, critique and rationalism fundamentally as being the kind of corrosive acid that eats away the glue that bonds society together. Um, and of course, for Vico, his cyclical uh, view of history uh, gives us the the solution, basically, or at least it gives us a narrative that produces a solution at the end of it. I, and I mean, this is this is not a, a talk about Vico, but I, I think that he is very much, I think he's an interesting character for us. I would even go so far as to say, like, people have asked me before, who is our Marx? I say, I, I would say he's a contender there. Yeah, um, I gave a speech at the London Forum in 2014 called Our Marx well, it was it was on Vico, and it's uh, our marks only better. Yeah, well, so, yeah, I think that's a great way. That's a great way of putting it. I, he certainly is superior to Marx, but yeah, he's definitely somebody that really needs to be revived, uh, especially in our circles. He just he fits so so much uh, into like what a, a lot of what we're about. Yeah, but um, he, yeah, he, he he doesn't need to be revived in our circles. He was never alive to begin with. <laughs> we need to well, yeah. we need to pump some life into uh, into him in our circles, or pump some Vico into our circles. I tried that with this with this talk that I gave in 2014. Well, God, time flies. It's eight years later now, almost yeah. eight years since I gave that, and uh, I haven't written any more about Vico. I did do a, a live stream with Academic Agent about him, so. That was a that was a, another gesture in that direction, but yeah, I I think Vico is is definitely our marks only better. He's definitely our guy. He's an inspiration to me in terms of the ideas that structure my thinking. I think in terms of Vico and Heidegger, both practically every day, Vico, Heidegger, and Plato are the ones that are most constitutive of my thinking, in just to. My, my reactions to reading the news or uh, thinking of, you know, reading, reading Sorel, or reading, reading anything from the newspapers to social media to works of political philosophy. Those are the three guys who most uh, structure how I react to things. So he's a huge influence on me. And yeah, I would like, to, I would like to popularize him more in our circles. And I, I guess I just need to do more writing about that. Well, if um, you know things go well, maybe next year there'll be there'll be an, an Imperium Press edition of New Science. Uh, there's there's a fair few of them out there, but um, it, it, he definitely needs to be framed from within our circles because I, I just think he fits like a glove. A lot of what he says is is very much sort of things that we are saying only they you know 300 years before or something like that yeah. so there's a there's a writer Stephen Holmes he's a sort of left wing liberal i think he's jewish he writes a lot about uh, people on the right scathingly for you know middle brow publications like the new york review of books anyway he uh, he wrote an essay called the permanent structure of anti liberal thought or something to that effect and i i remember reading that for the first time and thinking my god this is all about vico but i don't think he actually mentions vico anywhere in it but uh, vico is in a way the permanent structure of anti liberal thought he's like the archetype of anti liberal thought and he didn't have a, actually that much of an influence on subsequent thinkers. And in fact, Sorel is really the first first rate mind uh, that was influenced by Vico. And Vico died in what, 1745? And Sorel is writing this, is Sorel starts writing about Vico in the 1890s, uh, like 150 years had passed and no really first rate thinker had been influenced by him. The other first-rate thinker, creative genius, I think, who was influenced profoundly by Vico is James Joyce. But Sorel and Joyce, they're the first two that I can think of. And I can't think of anybody really on the same 
level is that? Well, I guess I would have to say Hans Georg Gadamer. Gadamer's up there with Sorel as a thinker, and he was influenced by Vico too. But there's a small number of people. He just hasn't found his audience yet. And I think it's the intellectuals of the new right who are the people who can get the most out of Vico. Well, there's a lot of overlap in this book with uh, Vichy and Thought. You can you can see it. He doesn't mention Vico all that much, maybe once twice, or something. Yeah, yeah. Once or twice. Not, not very much, but he's definitely there. He's under the surface. Um, Sorel wrote a, a very good study on Vico years before, so you can see how he's colored his thought. And definitely the the mythic aspect is 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 I think part of that legacy that Sorel has taken from him. So um, yeah, kudos to George Sorel for unearthing this this gem <laughs> that was yeah, absolutely. mostly buried until then. Yeah, absolutely. So let's wrap up. We've been going ninety minutes, but you know we're talking about Sorel. So who can? who can complain about enthusiasm? He would like enthusiasm. So how do people follow your work, uh, follow Imperium Press? And what are some of the things that might be coming out from Imperium Press in the next few months? Um, so yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me on. Um, it's been a pleasure. And uh, people can follow us at imperiumpress.org. Uh, if you go there, uh, you'll be able to find our social media. Uh, there's a link at the top. Follow us. You can follow us on Telegram. Uh, we've been banned from Twitter for the third time. So, you know, uh, it, it just keeps happening. But, um, yeah, uh, Telegram is the main place where we we uh, announce everything that we're doing. But we're also on Gab. We're on Post and a few others. Uh, if you go to the website, you can have a look through our catalog. I think that there's a lot of very interesting stuff there. Sorel is the latest. Um, as for what's coming up soon, um, some of the bigger projects that we're working on uh, that are going to come to fruition in the next few months or later this year, we actually have a uh, a series on uh, third position um essentially branches of fascism uh, that that's going to be coming out with uh, some of the primary sources uh, in the various branches. And we're going to start it off with a book that is essentially a survey of fascism. I think that this book, especially the survey, is going to be a kind of landmark for the radical right. I think that this is really going to be a go-to um I won't say who's writing it. It's not me, uh, but it's somebody that's very, very well known in our circles. Uh, so that's going to be announced probably in the next few months uh, later on this year as well, because this is a big project we've been working on for a while. We're going to launch a Latin course um, that is very much aimed at sort of replacing uh, Wheelock's Latin, but also the lingua Latina. It's a, it's it's very much. Um, a marriage between the two approaches to uh, grammar translation and the immersion method. Uh, I think Latin is something that's, that everyone should learn, to be honest. It, it, if you learn another language, anyone who has learned a second or third language, you know that it colors your thought. And Latin, uh, because of who you're going to be reading, is just based uh, inherently <laughs> Um and and these these people, the ancient Romans, were 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 quite impressive folks. And some of, some of why that is is the structures that are embedded into their language. So we're going to be coming out with a whole Latin course, which is a major project for us. We've got quite a few other interesting books. The next one that's going to drop, I think, is going to be a volume of original poetry. We were talking before about the need for art in our scene. The the next book that we're going to drop is a book of original poetry by a poet in our scene. Uh, I think we need more of that stuff. I think we need a lot more uh, original art. So uh, that's just a taste of some of the stuff that's, that's coming up soon. Um, it's going to be a busy end of the year for us, I think. Well, I look forward to it very much. So thank you, Mike, very much for coming on. And everyone out there, I hope you are frantically looking up how to buy reflections on violence. I think it's worth a worthwhile and inspiring read. And we will definitely have you back again. Uh, well, there's going to be no shortage of books to talk about in the future. So thanks again. And we'll just have many more conversations in the future. Thanks for having me.